Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you once again for joining us today. I'm Jim D'Antona, the President and CEO of the San Luis Obispo Chamber of Commerce. This is our weekly free webinar series to provide our community with the most credible and up-to-date information and resources. If you've been with us over the past eight weeks, we've been bringing you information on what you can do to get ready and prepare for the reopening. Today, we're gonna to build on last week's webinar and get you more of the specifics of reopening that is allowed in the full stage two, plus some new additional pieces uh, of the Governor's Resilience Roadmap. Last week, our county received clearance to proceed. Uh, and then earlier this week, we got a little bit of a surprise announcement by the Governor for hair salons and, and barber shops. I know that when you leave today, you will have a lot of information to help your business and information you can share with your colleagues to make sure reopening is successful. Hopefully all these recommendations will limit your liability and any backslide for our economy. As with all of our webinars, we will allow our presenters to go through their presentation and then we will take your questions. As a reminder, please use the Q&A button below to submit questions. And I will bring those questions to our panelists during the question and answer section. Um, please, don't, uh, please remember, don't post the questions in the chat panel. Uh, we will be using that to provide web website links to you for your reference. On our panel today are four members of the county team, though one will be their primary, that are responsible for many of the guidelines we're talking about today. Uh, the, folks will, the person we'll see the most is our guest from last week, Lori Sallow, supervisor from the county's environmental health department, and she's being backed up by Liz Pazabon, Director of the County's Environmental Health Department, Dr. Rick Rosen, who's the County's Deputy Public Health Officer, Anita Konaba, County Emergency Services Coordinator, and additionally, we are joined by Rennell Baldwin, founder of Dignified Hope Care, a senior care company on the Central Coast, and has been using her skill set to assist businesses in their self-risk assessments and reopening process. As I did last week, I wanna walk you through some of the important information on the website and information that the county has put together that will jumpstart our conversation and, and help you understand some of the information that is gonna be shared by the panelists. So I'm gonna start with a screen share, screen share here and get you going on where we're at. Uh, as you can see, this is going over to readyslow.org. Um, and we want to scroll down right here, go to visit our reopening page. As you do that, um, you're going to be able to see all the information of the current stage, uh, the steps to reopening, a, a really nicely numbered guide all the way through that. And then through each stage, you'll be able to see who was able to open and what are the resources available to them. So as you see, we're here in stage two and you can see who has been allowed to open and when actually the dates they're allowed to do that. And as you might see right there, we have in-person religious services that came online May 25th, hair salons and barber shops, one I'm extremely thankful for on May 26th. And then our county libraries will start curbside service on June 1. So by opening each of these sections, you're gonna be able to find the guidance for each of these sections, both for what is the really detailed um, measures that you have to take uh, for your businesses. Right here, the, obviously the, this is from Cal OSHA, this is their COVID-19 in, uh, in industry guidance for hair salons and barbershops. Gives you a, a, a brief overview, and then it goes deeper into all of the pieces uh, that are required for those specific plans. And again, all of these are available, not just for this one industry, but for all of the industries that are open during this time. As you can see, schools, shared pools, outdoor museums, and at the top there, which was one of our early ones, was on the destination retail and drive-in, uh, dine-in restaurants. A uh, drive-in restaurant would be interesting too. Um, but these are all these, and then it will drop you into additional slow county measures to protect uh, the public health. And this will be uh, information for you um, on specific things that uh, you should be taking on in order to deal uh, with the COVID crisis and maintain the public health. 
And again, you can see this is a great one pager that will help you do all of those things. And the most important part, and I think this is one that we really, I want to really want to drive home is the ready to reopen toolkit and self certification form. This is extremely important and is the key to your reopen. Um, the readiness to reopen self certification for you can see clearly there's the numbered guidance of how, what steps you should follow in order to do this. And then in that second section, we'll be looking at the readiness to reopen self certification form. This is the key for you and uh, to open up your business is that you have followed the business, you've filled out this form, um, this PDF, in order to, and answered all of the questions that are there. The first question being maybe the most important, which is performed a detailed risk assessment and implement a site-specific protection plan in accordance with the state guidance document, which was that initial document we started going through um, uh, regarding the hair, uh, in the hair salon piece. Um, all of these, this piece here needs to be completed and it's not, it doesn't need to be sent in anywhere, but it needs to be completed for your business to reopen. After you have finished this piece, the uh, toolkit has provided you with some great signage, open and safe signage. You can commercially print it here or your in-house printing that you can literally do in there. And I think this is a great piece to let your customers know and your employees know that you've done the work to get to a open and safe business. We believe at the chamber, and I know the county, and this is why they've provided it, when we get to see these, we'll know that our community has done it, what it can to protect itself. So additionally, you can look at those uh, other, further down there they were talking about, we don't have to go back to it, but we will uh, go back and you will see other signage for your employees on how to do work. But all of this site, this re from readyslow.org, you can go and find out for your business. So what I'd like to do right now is actually uh, have uh, Lori Sallow uh, walk us through some of the more, as we've gotten a little further into this um, reopening, uh, they've come up with more specifics. And so Lori, I'd like to bring you on and have you start uh, going through your PowerPoint. Um, thank you, Jim. Um, first, I want to say good good afternoon to everybody. And this is I'm fairly new at Zoom, so I'm going to attempt my screen share. I apologize if it takes a few clicks, uh, but I think um, you can let me know if this will work. Come on. And we're all uh, we've all done this one. There, there, there it is. Got it. Is it the correct one, um, Dan? It's, do you see that? It's, it's a retail. Is it the full screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. That's what we need. Okay, so um, like I said, I just want to say good afternoon to everybody, and today I will be providing guidance on our retail businesses. Um, I'll try to not make it specific to our food industry because some of it is um, exactly the same. So these are the business retail businesses criteria to reopen, and I'll go through this. It's pretty short PowerPoint, but it... Um, We'll go over a lot of the stuff that Jim has mentioned as well, um, and we'll try to get into a little bit more detail on that. Um, all of our documents that we produce for these are public records, so if anybody needs them, just let us know. So <clears throat> let me start with, um, okay, so here's a slight, a, a little agenda of what I'm going to be talking about. Um, most of these bullet points are the items that were on the um, list that Jim showed you on the guidance for your different types of business. Um, so we will walk through these bullet points trying to help you uh, identify your risk areas in your businesses and try to give you examples and a, a reference if you need some assistance in doing that. So the purpose, as I mentioned, um, is to assist you in the development of a business plan for your specific facility that will help you prevent the spread of COVID and support a safe and clean environment for your workers and your customers. Um, so 
here's uh, the slide that uh, Jim was showing, the website. It's at readyslow.org, uh, and it does show the different stages of uh, reopening. Um, we are currently at stage two. Um, all of those businesses that are allowed to be open are listed under the stage two um, in on that readyslow.org. Um, they all have checklists and documents of guidance for the different types of business. You saw a snapshot of that. Um, and you can um, also see the projected future stages of reopening. So here's, here's a list of, in stage two, the businesses that were afforded the ability to open, whether it was at, at full capacity or at a reduced capacity. Um, the, uh, if you click on the, the plus sign on next to the specific document, it will open up that um, compilation of documents that Jim was showing you. Um, a large portion of these criteria and the guidance overlap. So you'll find that in all the different businesses, there are a lot of similarities for your risk assessment. So uh, as you uh, are probably aware, and we've already mentioned, these are the future stages of opening, stage three and four. Um, you will see the facilities that are going to be allowed in stage three and stage four, at least at this point, the science points, at this time, the science points to this is the order that we would open. Now, with future uh, outbreaks or, or reductions in outbreaks, these could be modified and changed. But at this point, and currently, this is what uh, we have proposed. Um, so, as Jim was mentioning, there are a few steps in order for your business to be able to reopen. Um, I won't say that they're all easy. Um, the most difficult part will be doing your uh, plan, your proposed plan to reduce the exposure and spread of, of COVID in your business. So I would recommend that the first step was find your industry or something as close to your industry as you can in those guidance documents. Um, review that guidance. When you go over the guidance document, it will self-explain how your checklist will play into your facility. So you have your guidance document and you have a checklist that all of the components of both correspond to each other. So as you read through the, the more um, detailed guidance document, it will assist you in filling out the specific checklist associated with your industry. So first you develop your plan. Here's where you identify all your areas of risk and where you might have areas that don't have a, a six foot separation type. Uh, that might be a problem area that you'll have to work out in your plan. Uh, and then you will all obviously have to train your employees on that plan. Um, walk them through that checklist. Make sure they understand what that checklist means, what, what the comment on the checklist means. Um, that's part of the training is that they can reference and re-reference that document and, and continue to understand what the expectation of them is in their facilities, in their businesses. Then you want to post that plan so that those employees can see it and they can re-reference it, as I mentioned. Um, then you want to fill out the ready to open self-certification form um, that I think Jim showed us. And you would just retain that at your business. As he said, you don't need to mail that to people. Um, you want to post the plan, your checklist, so you, like I said, so your employees can reference it. You want to put out the ready to reopen. And then once you have done those things, you can um, open your business. Um, and then, of course, you would try to comply as best you can with that plan that you have created and trained your employees on. So back to the risk part. I know that seems to be a, a hang up for a lot of people. So the first thing the business should do is identify all the risky areas and the risky processes that your business um, may engage in, um, where, where the disease transmission may likely occur, where people are gonna come too close to each other, or it's going to be a very um, high customer contact type area. So there are different types of transmissions and examples are person-to-person uh, -person transmission. The most likely way of transmitting it is person-to-person. -person. So that could be employee to employee, it could be employee to customer, 
Um, it could be customer to customer. So that's an area you want to look at is, is there a potential transmission point in our facility where the employees or our customers or service people that bring product to my, to my business um, could potentially have a transmission issue? If your employees cannot physically distance, um, the answer is, what do I do? I, or the question is, what do I do? Um, your answer, your plan could say, well, we'll wear face protection. Or if face protection isn't the desired uh, mechanism, then you can maybe alternate shifts of the staff so there's not as many uh, workers in, in your facility. If there's a point where the employee can't stay six feet away from a customer, what do I do? Uh, potentially you can, uh, such as a cashier location where you may not have the ability to, to move customers away from your employee. Um, maybe there's a plexiglass barrier or you set a, uh, a distancing table or something to create a separation. Uh, but those are the things you're going to want to identify um, in the person-to-person -person type transmission. Um, then there's high customer contact or high traffic areas. Um, examples of that are your, your entry points of your business. If you have a lobby in your business um, or maybe you have bathrooms that your customers can use for, you know, that you have frequent use of your customers in your bathrooms. Um, you want to make sure you have a plan to disinfect and clean those areas where you have a lot of touching and a lot of people um, talking and speaking and laughing. Um, other locations where contamination occur are, are your workstations where you have a lot of people moving through a, a specific point. Countertops, um, maybe it's a a countertop near um, your cash register where a lot of people are, are um, standing in their six foot of separation, but it might be an area that you would need to add more frequent cleaning to. So those are the kinds of things that are involved in developing your site specific work plan. Um, anything that will assist in preventing the transmission, transmission in your business is, is what this is referencing and what you would need to think of. So then at this point, your plan is established uh, and you're gonna train your employees on that. What you wanna make sure your employees understand are what are the COVID symptoms and how is it spread so that they can be engaged and, and understand what they can do to help the business and the public stop um, the spread and emphasize the importance of their self-monitoring. Um, you want to teach them what those symptoms are so that they can monitor themselves or that they can monitor before coming into work to determine if you're sick or symptomatic. And of course, if you're sick or symptomatic, you need to um, not go to work. And, and the, um, employee, the employers um, need to support that as well. Uh, so it's very important that your employees understand and know uh, what the expectation is from you and when they are monitoring themselves and looking for these symptoms. And here's the, the symptoms from the CDC. Um, they have added a few symptoms on this list since it was first posted, but it is the most um, common symptoms associated with uh, coronavirus. So you wanna make sure your, your employees understand these are the symptoms and these are the things that they wanna look for. Also on this CDC website is this self-checker right here. It's on this same page. You can put, you can go through. It asks you questions, and based on what the question is and what your specific situation is, you would answer it. It's very interactive. It tells you maybe you should go to a doctor. Uh, I ran through it, and it told me I was fine. Don't worry about it because I didn't have any of those symptoms. I didn't have any of those issues, but it's a good thing if you're not sure to have maybe your employees run through that so that they understand what they should be um, looking for amongst themselves. Um, and then we have the toolkit. This, as uh, Jim mentioned again, is really, really helpful if you're struggling or you need to make sure you're not comfortable that your plan is, is complete or um, hitting all the key points to to make sure your business is a safe uh, environment for the customers uh, and your employees to come into. So here's where the, all of those forms in are that we just were talking about. Um, you have your self-certification forms here. You have your signage. Um, you have uh, guidelines for your different types of business. Um, lots of um, verbal 
uh, sign, the, not verbals, lots of um, signage to help guide guide your customers so that they understand their visual cues for you. So you're not having to constantly talk to people. You can put up those visual cues. Uh, and most most people um, are are happy about seeing what the expectation of the business is, so that they're not um, putting themselves and others at risk. So every different type of business that was listed will have these types of, of guidance and tools for you to use in the toolkit. Here's some examples of the ready to reopen sign that is posted when you have completed all those forms and you are ready to open, you post this so the public knows that you have completed that and that you're safe and open. Um, here's just another example of your social distancing requirement sign. Uh, a lot of people are very visual. This helps uh, customers understand what you want them to do. Um, and here's the obvious business readiness to open self-evaluation and certification. Coincidentally, all of these categories correspond to those guidance documents and the checklist. Um, so once you have completed the, the checklist, it also helps you uh, complete this self-evaluation. Once you have completed this self-evaluation, you are okay to open. And as mentioned, none of these forms need to be submitted. You hold them on site. Um, so here's an example of a retail business checklist that goes along with their guidance document. Um, the key component of the work specific plans are that you have developed a plan based on the risks that are, are located at your specific business. Um, the next component is to train your employees on the plan. Uh, then you want to utilize your control measures, um, which would be you know, to also screen your staff. Screen for symptoms. Um, talk about uh, what the use of the face coverings might be necessary in your business. Um, increase distance between um, locations. In our world, in food, it's between tables. In your world, it might also be between tables or racks or uh, display cabinets or something where you want to keep the public uh, away from one another. So you want to look at how your business is laid out. Um, then you want to establish the appropriate cleaning and sanitizing throughout your business. Uh, if you have a very common area that the public touches, you want to put that on a very frequent cleaning schedule. Put that in your plan. Um, if you recognize an area that you didn't include your plan, but it becomes a problem, the plan should be modified over time. It should be, um, it should be curtailed and and move, it, it should be a dynamic document that as you recognize areas that are working well, you keep them and then you recognize areas that might not be as successful that you change those. Um, and then of course the physical distancing. Um, I think most people are pretty clear about social distancing. Um, and there is the, the physical distancing checklist. Like I said, it, it walks you through the process. It helps you identify those areas in a business uh, that you could, um, set up your plan to, to assist. Um, and then you want to have a monitor that makes the changes um, to that plan and assures that your, pub, that your customers and your employees are following that plan. Uh, and then lastly but not least, here's the information you would need to call uh, or to visit readyslow.org. Uh, That's great, Lori. I, that was uh, incredibly uh, helpful information um, and very detailed, which I, I'm so appreciative of from, again, we've seen this from the county from uh, point one, that uh, trying to put out the best information possible to get people uh, everything they need to know. I think one of the things uh, you popped in on real quickly um, was looking at the next section, uh, stage three, whenever that comes to be. Um, is it, is that, do you already have the guidelines in there for what stage three would need when those businesses open? Unmuted. Yeah. Um, for facilities that we regulate, we have um, kind of jumped and, and tried to create documents to assist them in the, the different stages. Um, and if we know how that's going to roll out, we absolutely try to get ahead of the game. We send out postcards telling 
businesses that information is available at this location. Um, what I have experienced though is we don't know what's going, what the, like we didn't know that the beauty salons and hair salons and things like that were opening until they did. Um, same with um, some of the sw public swimming pools. We, we don't get a, a heads up ahead of time. Um, so we, we try to read where the, you know, read the tea leaves and understand what direction we're going, but sometimes our crystal ball is a little foggy. So um, we, we are trying to get ahead. Um, sometimes we're successful and sometimes we're not. But once we know what's going on, we absolutely uh, get that information out to our operators as best we can. First thing we do is we will call all of our operators and talk to them about like the f restaurants when they first started to uh, be able to do takeout, um, we contacted every single one and talked to them about what concerns they might have, were they open, did they need assistance and how to operate. Other entities would be available for their businesses as well, I would hope. Yeah, and that's where, in seeing the stage three note there, uh, you know, seeing A, see the list of who do, who can start preparing, but also where you have the nail salon potentially if they're getting ready and seeing what the others are having to do, you know, they can prepare even further ahead um, and know what they're gonna potentially be looking at. So I think that's uh, extremely helpful information where that's, but I think to your point, uh, I'm not sure the governor knows what's coming up <laughs> or coming off the list day by day, uh, as we found out with hair salons and, and barber shops. Um, right, so and, and a lot of the guidance, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. A lot of the guidance for these other types of businesses that haven't opened, um, a lot of the, you know, the health and safety components of it will be exactly the same. There just might be specifics that we don't understand, like limitations as to how many can, how many people can be in different types of businesses. Um, hair salons, there's a face mask for both. Um, those are the unique nature decisions that are made that we won't be aware of right up front. But we obviously know how to guide businesses in the um, plan, the sanitizing, the social distancing, the signage, where to guide them to get that type of information. Usually what we don't understand is the more specific limitations that are put. Maybe they're not fully able to operate, but we're not sure where do they fall on that spectrum of no operation versus fully operational. Um, we might not know that. Yeah, and it, it's per, again. I, I think for for our guests here here today, and uh, as as we do for the chamber, we obviously get that out to folks who may not be on the call or didn't know about it, or like, well, I'm on stage three. I'm not going to bother yet. You know, get that information out because you, a you never know what day that will be that stage three gets uh, opened. Uh, uh, hopefully sooner than later, but you never know. And so getting all that, the county is doing a great job of getting that. So sharing that information where possible, uh, obviously is super helpful. So thank you so much, Lori, for going through that. Um, what You're I will say, welcome. yeah, what I will say is the county, uh, as we've been doing our webinars, one of the great things is we've um, in, asked for some help and they've, uh, the county has responded. And as you can see, your questions are literally getting answered before uh, in writing. Uh, right there on the answer tab. So if you have questions that you asked, uh, please look, they're answered right now, currently in the answered section, or if you wanna see what others asked, check over there, the county uh, staff uh, who are making these decisions are answering them right there for you. Um, and if you have more questions, feel free to throw those in, we, but we'll have time for that. What I'd like to do right now is uh, bring forward Renelle Baldwin, uh, founder of Dignified Hope Care. Um, and she's been uh, using her skill set in her senior care company to, to assist businesses in their self-risk assessment and reopening process. As she's been uh, working on those, you know, uh, maybe, Renelle, you can tell us a little bit about your background and connection to the skill set and, and how you're helping kind of with the retail uh, business and large-scale operations to get, get up and running. Well, thanks, Jim. Thanks for having me. And um, I am immensely grateful that I was an essential business during this time, but in that being said, I, I also was caring for the most at-risk patients that um, could have died um, from this um, virus. So in vamping up 
working with my medical staff and wanting them to take all precautions, um, it was a little, I would say, on the easier side for me to do so because of working with all medically trained RN, LVN, EMPs, CNAs, and medical assistants, they at least have the skill set to understand these precautions and to implement them um, with just simple instruction. Um, in doing so, and as things have progressed and thinking of non-medical businesses um, reopening, I, I just thought, wow, I, I feel much more informed because I am a medical business in nature. Um, how are these non-medical businesses going to feel going through these checklists, um, being asked questions by their employees um, that maybe are medical in nature and they don't have the answers to? And then also as a business owner, being on that side of things, um, what things am I gonna be liable for? Um, so, you know, I, I was doing a lot of self-assessing, getting a lot of feedback from my staff, getting a lot of feedback from my patients' families of all the precautions I was taking, and then also seeing in our local facilities the precautions that they took, even with my trained medical staff coming into their places of business to limit their risk. Um, so in doing so, I thought, how can I use this skill set to, to better help the community? Um, I'm part of Rotary, that's how I got to know Jim um, at, on a personal level. And so in, in Rotary, we're, we're always looking at community opportunities to help other people. And out of necessity, I had to start learning how to make hand sanitizer because I couldn't purchase it anywhere as many people um, were having issues with that. I started doing it for my staff and for my patients, and then their family members started wanting to purchase it. And, um, I, I didn't intend on becoming a hand sanitizing business, but it, it's become a, a side a side step to help um, along with what I'm now doing. And so I am doing consulting with non-medical businesses. Um, I've done them in an array of uh, arenas to help navigate what um, Lori was going over that people can self do. Um, there are the checklists through the county of what to go through, but a business, and I asked for her permission to, to share her, her name and her experience um, that kind of felt confused in nature was the owner of Ambiance Clothing Store, Canyon January is the owner. Um, she you know, wanted to make sure she was doing her best effort um, to protect her staff um, to protect her business entity and, and ultimately protect her customers. Um, so I went out to her place of business. I helped, you know, look at her site and where things were high risk. Um, I had my nurse come out and do a training session with all of her um, staff there. And, and one was actually even ill. So she videoed um, the session for that person that we, of course, didn't want her that day. And, um, and put together packets so that they're going, the employees have all those copies that the owners are going through themselves to check out and empower the employees to be self-aware of what their owners are doing um, to, to protect them as employees and the, the clients that come into their door. Um, then the most important component I felt like was that then those questions that were asked, having a clinical um, nurse there to answer those um, was really helpful for a retail business or a car dealership or a physical therapy office, um, you know, that, you know, didn't have clinicians on staff. Um, those, it could be very helpful to have a nurse to answer those questions on the spot. Um, and then uh, we also do help with signage um, and looking around the place of uh, reminders, um, looking at are they going to allow restrooms to be publicly used and um, what types of cleaners, um, when gloves are appropriate to wear, when face masks are appropriate or, or recommended to wear. Um, and I'm working in, in different cities and, and now even different counties, so I'm learning both Santa Barbara and San Luis Obispo um, ordinances and those change daily. Um, but, uh, you know, this is, this is why I, I decided to add on this component of not just providing senior care and, and post-operative plastic surgical care and care for, for new moms, but using that skill set to help businesses reopen. Well, and I know that you come from obviously a very uh, regulated industry. 
Um, <laughs> and so having worked with, um, uh, you know, obviously government and regulation, is that, is that some of what you're helping folks? What, what are some of those, yeah, I would say like Canon uh, or other retailers are looking at, what are those blind spots sometimes that you're finding um, to help them figure that out? Well, I mean, the main thing, I mean, is thinking of, um, you know, asking for your staff to be self-checking themselves. Um, people are also, some businesses are implementing um, using a screening before you come in their facility, per se. It's a senior facility. Um, some places of business are opting to have their clients sign a waiver that they haven't traveled or, you know, have they had any of these symptoms. Um, you know, you also have to remember that um, in talking in medical nature that you have to be HIPAA compliant. Um, and if you're keeping charting of people's medical information that you have to be in compliance to that as well. Um, so I have recommendations that I make if, if people are gonna ongoing keep records. Um, there's wonderful um, online source resources that are HIPAA compliant that I use um, in my medical um, paperwork. Um, that other non-medical businesses could be using as well um, in, in that portion of things. Yeah, and that's, it's something interesting um, trying to figure out um, as, a, as an employer, right? Um, how do, is there good ways of asking or is that something you're involved in and asking your employees on whether they're sick or not, doing their temperature checks? Where is that line of, of how far an employer, I know you're not a lawyer and you're not giving legal advice. Let's, yeah. you know, about, thank you for that disclosure. <laughs> yes, uh, because I'm about to do one of the same. So I figure I'll get that out early. I'm not a lawyer either, but had some things which talk about liability. But um, as you're setting up your, or working with companies and their plans, um, are there things that you're, from your experience in your industry, about how you can ask these questions of employees or um, is there a, should you check with an attorney before you do all these things? Well, I know for me, I did check with my business attorney. He's very well versed in, in medical law. So um, that's important for, for my business, business entity. Um, even in wanting to do this consulting, he helped prepare the waivers that I needed to protect me. Um, in, in case I'm helping those and laws change and whatnot. Um, but, you know, you do have to be careful and in what nature that you talk with your staff um, and what depths that you go. You, you don't know when something's going to turn around and, and affect you in a negative way. Um, I know I also uh, look at non-medical businesses and some that I've even been in um, as a customer and, you know, seeing are people really social distancing you know, are there, did I see any signs here? You know, there's red tape on the ground, but does, what does that mean to me? Because it's not really labeled actually to tell me, to remind me to stay six feet away. Um, so doing some of that, that self-assessing um, with a service like mine to kind of help troubleshoot that, I think thinks you th makes you think a little broader, makes you think from more of a medical standpoint of what I should and shouldn't ask. Um, and you also need to think about medical discrimination. Um, there was a penal code that was brought to my attention and that was after, um, actually it was from the questions that were being asked at one of, from one of the employees at Ambiance um, of, you know, what can we ask a client? You know, we're, we're coming into allergy season right now. We're seeing people sneeze because we see all this beautiful um, flowers blooming um, with all the water that we are thankful for. Um, but you know, are they sneezing because they, they, uh, they smelled the flowers, they walked in the door, are they sneezing and coughing because it, it may be COVID related. So you got to be very careful of how you communicate so that you're not, um, and falling into that, that legal disclaimer of, of medical, just, you know, discrimination as well. So. Well, and that was one of the things I thought was, uh, extremely important from, uh, the conversation you were having right there was. Um, you know, again, back to the, I'm not an attorney, I'm not giving legal advice, but um, one would believe that if you're doing back, and also with what the county was setting forward, the idea that um, creating these documents help limit your liability to, for your employees, uh, for your customers, um, obviously nothing keeps you 100% safe, 
but showing that you've considered these things and or having someone come and give those second pair of eyes to look at some of these things that maybe you would miss would, would create some help, whether it protects you or not, right? Absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at some bigger clientele that are needing where there's hundreds of employees, which I haven't done to that extent yet. And I'm even having a, a physician and a nurse practitioner come on, on a much you know, larger scale like that for their assistance. Um, we're all walking the line as, as business owners and, and coming out of our, our homes into our community of how we can best keep each other safe and how we can get our economy going again. So, you know, I, I put it out there, I know you knew from Rotary that, um, you know, if there's some struggling, there's some structures that I, I can happily share and I know you'll get my contact information um, of where people kind of self walk through, through themselves to um, get to that final destination. And then there's some people that, that don't have the time, they may not be even physically on location to their job and not sure if their management can handle um, that level of responsibility before opening those doors. So that's where I can come in and hopefully be of assistance and help um, to, to consult with them and help them further. And Renelle, do you, I mean, have you, in the ones you've done, has there been a misconception or, or we've gotten a question off of Facebook Live, mm -hmm. and like a number one misconception as to uh, what a business might think or what employees might think? Have you seen something that comes off right away that? So the most immediate question that keeps coming up is um, both from either clients or the staff, like should we wear gloves all the time? Do we have to wear a face mask every time? And really that boils um, gloves. Um, let's start with face masks. Face mask, um, there's different ordinances that I'm working with. Pismo has a different ordinance than we do. Um, so there is some requirements that um, we need to stay in compliance with um, if we're um, being instructed to do so. But, um, you know, also using your best judgment as an owner of how you're going to respond to your employees or to your clients of wearing those um, precautions. Um, gloves, on the other hand, um, I've actually seen a lot of examples of poor use of gloves. Um, as I, I walk around, I mean, I see people driving with them on and they're reaching their pockets and getting money and, and then they're grabbing their cookie to eat with their gloves all on thinking that, that they're being sanitary with those gloves. Um, gloves are like sponges. They actually will hold on to a, a virus um, or bacteria more so than, than protecting us. But we are now additionally using cleaners that are very strong in nature too clean and sanitize these areas. And that, that is an appropriate area where we want to be gloved and protect our hands. We don't want to create openings um, that then are now, you know, more susceptible to getting infection. Um, so, you know, that's been the most common is, is face covering and, and gloves, you know, and when and where is appropriate. And so each, each business is specific. Um, I, I like to Lori's analogy of it being like a foggy crystal ball. Um, I, 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 when I had Jordan Cunningham on my first Zoom meeting yesterday, um, he, he kept referencing to the word as vague. And he kept referencing me back to look at your Sydney, city ordinances, um, listen to your county. And um, I, the chamber is a, a wonderful resource for, for even me to, to, to go back and, and double check. Have I checked that off my list? So um, thank you. Well, yeah, and it's, I love your, uh, that's a great point about the gloves. And, and as someone, again, I've been on enough of these calls with uh, the county and Dr. Bornstein and all of these. So I do see a lot of people with their uh, gloves on and then I watch what happens and I'm like, oh boy, that didn't, uh, I don't know if you did anything to protect yourself because you just kind of picked it with you. Your, your hands are clean, but you just put them on your face, but your, the gloves are hit touching. So very funny. Have you seen anybody do, um, from a question from the audience is, uh, somebody that's done something really creative or interesting to deal with it, whether it's protecting their um, uh, merchandise, like making sure it's clean or available. Um, anything interesting that you've seen in that, from that perspective? So in the retail industry, I mean, obviously your attraction is that people are going to connect with something and they're going to buy it. Um, so in some instances, I'm having to remind um, businesses that you need to take away places that are going to be common 
you know, grab, grab stations like at ambiance, they have a beautiful little bowl of earrings that they want you to pick through and pick a color to match your dress. Um, so me reminding them that, you know, removing places like that, that are kind of communal, that we're going to be grabbing this obviously a, a safety parameter, but, um, you know, because of the checklist that already exists, some of the other businesses that I've gone into have already started to remove those things and think that way themselves. Um, you know, I think the more collaboration that we can do um, as a community and better informing each other is, is really the best case scenario. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, what I'll do is I'll uh, ask, you know, a couple of questions. I have a couple questions for Lori um, on the county side. Um, in terms of, obviously, I think there was a question that came up in there um, about who is... Uh, responsible for kind of the enforcement piece of um, the, the rules, whether you're in the city of SLO, if you're in the unincorporated, if you're out in the city of Pismo, um, is the county um, the enforcement arm? Uh, is the city, are we all still working through that? Have you guys talked about that? We actually have um, because we have had a, a very, very small percentage of people that uh, have made more um, a multiple mistakes <laughs> in opening maybe when they shouldn't and um, what we do at, at least in our industry and and the county seems to be very similar in other uh, sectors is we'll go out and educate the operator first we'll say were you aware that you weren't supposed to open um, in my world we've had some swimming pools uh, operators that open their pools by mistake um, they thought they met the criteria to be the residential private type public pool, um, which hotels, things like that were not. So we went out first. We, most of the time we get a complaint from somebody that it has happened <clears throat> and we'll go out. We'll confirm that yes, um, you mistakenly opened or in error or whatever the reason. We will educate them on, on the criteria that when they will be able to open and it is not at this time give them the opportunity to understand and not uh, violate the, the order. Uh, if they do it again, um, we, we work with code enforcement and the law enforcement, depending on where it's at. Um, I know in the county we're utilizing uh, county code enforcement. Uh, in some areas they're using law enforcement and that is usually, I think, determined by the city's infrastructure and what they have available to use. Um, in one case, uh, our office, we're utilizing the county code enforcement officers because obviously they're, they're used to doing that kind of thing. It's what they go out for people that have violated county codes. Um, and, but we do start with an education just to make sure that you know, the person understands the rules. Um, we allow them to understand that and then hopefully they do the right thing. So, and we have been very successful in that. Yeah, it's been very, I mean, I would say, uh, in, I know in the city of Slow, working closely with this uh, Derek Johnson, uh, city manager, and Lee Johnson, their interim economic development manager, they're really trying to get to the inform uh, before uh, we get to enforcement. Um, because again, these are, the rules aren't super clear. I, we had a question even in uh, today about where uh, adventure tourism would go, and it's a great question. Uh, <laughs> and I think even we had a tough time trying to figure out exactly where that would fit. Um, so I, I'm certainly appreciative. I know uh, from the chamber, we are appreciative that they're working through that. Um, and can you just touch real quick back on the pool one? Because that's one actually that's, I was, uh, I would have thought the hotel pool is private, but uh, wanted to find out, if, can you give us some clarifications as to who is okay and who's not? Sure, um, public pools uh, are any pool that the general public um, can get into, just let's, let's start with that. Apartment complexes, when they're over a certain number, become more of a public pool than a private backyard pool. Um, and so first the, the determination is, are you a public or a private pool? We have very public pools, Kennedy's, the hotels, um, Sinsheimer pools that are obviously huge uh, volume of public, huge volume of people using them. Um, and so those pools were determined to be not 
okay to open yet, the Kennedys, the Sinsheimers, the hotel pools, what was allowed to be open in the public pool spectrum were pools that were established for homeowners, residents, um, HOA type pools where it's really a pool for the community to use and not ju the general public. Um, I had a relative lived in a mobile home park. No outside people were supposed to use that pool when I was young. She had to get special permission to let me use it. We're, we, the um, early stage two or late stage two that allowed those first pools to open were those, those homeowner association type pools. Um, uh, so, uh, there was a couple homeowner association pools that were also therapy pools for their residents. Um, those were the first pools that were allowed to be open. Now they also had specific criteria that have to, had to be met in order for them to open. And just like the checklists for other businesses, they had their requirements that they had to, to get uh, situated and in order before they could open. So those uh, homeowner type association, the residential pools, um, were the first set to open, uh, and we had and there, the public, the more larger, more public hotel, motel, um, gym, uh, community pools um, haven't been allowed to open yet. They they're a little bit more difficult to control the atmosphere at those. Um, they tend to have a lot more people in them, um, so that that fell to another stage. Okay, yeah, that's helpful, and again, that's. Um, this is back to that point uh, when, you know, we've had some uh, conversations with people out there on why aren't they enforcing it? It's like, if, uh, you know, it takes a lot of, a lot of reading to figure out exactly which ones uh, belong in which spots. So um, it, it's very helpful to have these dialogues for our participants to know as they're out there, what things are real and what things are not, uh, which rules are enforced, which ones are not, or if they're going to call in a complaint that they have some idea of what's, uh, of what is uh, legal and what's not. Um, I think one of the ones that I'm not sure if Dr. Rosen uh, can get on um, a, something he could speak to, but it's, uh, we had a question earlier related to that what's the difference, if there's a difference between the hair salon and a nail salon, and why are they considered separate? Um, is there, if, I don't know if he's available on any of the uh, microphones. Uh, sure. There he is. Oh. Can you hear me all right is the first question. I'm taking that as a yes, great. Uh, so I, I think the idea relates to whether it's face -to -face, a face-to-face -face encounter or not, and that's the primary rationale, as I understand it. So that's not a county, like the county's not the one making the call. The state has drawn a line somewhere in a sand and said, this one's in, this one's out. Correct. Right. Yeah, that guidance is coming from the state. Whereas a nail salon, you do sit a little closer face to face as opposed to a haircut, which is usually happening around you. In right. Theory. <laughs> in theory. In theory. Yeah, in theory. So uh, that's a, a great point in that one of the things we have to remember is that um, we weren't giving our, we're not implementing our own start guide, correct? We're implementing the state's reopening guide, which is their uh, rules. Right, that's right. And if, there, if we can identify any gaps or if any gaps are identified, we try to fill in those gaps or clarify, but otherwise we're following what the state is telling us. Fabulous. Well, thank you for doing that. That's, uh, it's helpful. And again, one of those uh, key pieces where uh, folks have asked the question, actually it was, uh, I, now that I remember, it was actually a webinar this morning where this came up. Um, and uh, people were asking these questions because there isn't you know, real clear reasons. I mean, we can talk about wineries, we can talk about all of these that have, that can maybe even be more distant because they're on a vineyard. Uh, but, you know, again, these are the rules being brought down by the state and we're implementing and doing analysis where we can, but not necessarily all of those. So thank you, doctor. Um, what I would say is, you know, I really appreciate everybody's um, coming out and we'll have time for just like one more question. Do we know, and I'm not sure if this fits to Lori um, or Ronell or somebody, is there a limit on the number of people that can be in a retail business at one time? Is that limited by square footage? Is that, 
you know, it, it would be different between a building that's real thin and real fat. Uh, anybody have a theory on, or at least a ratio on how people could figure that? That's a, a really good question. We've actually punted that around our office. <clears throat> and I have read somewhere, and I, I can't reference where, because every day we're reading lots of literature from lots of different sources, that the preference, and I haven't seen it in our guidance, to reduce your uh, population by about 50%. Um, I think if you can reduce your maximum capacity, you're not trying to put whatever your maximum is in your facility, and you can figure out what's a good social separation, what areas do I have to move around, which obviously might limit your internal capacity for people. Um, I think people have to look at it reasonably and figure how can I uh, figure my, my occupancy based on how far I spread people out, how much interaction goes on inside my business. I mean, do people cross over back and forth? Can I create a, a one-way route through my business to not have them overlapping? I think depending on your plan, you might be able to put more people in your business um, based on your layout. If, you're, if your layout of your business is just really interactive with people and, and you can't really separate, in those cases, they may have to reduce, reduce their capacity quite a bit. Um, but I think we're trying to stay away from telling you this is what you have to do percentage wise, like the flat 50%, 30%, 70%, because I think people can get creative and we, they, will, they will be rewarded for creativity that keeps the intent going in their business. So I think there's a hesitation to say you can only have 10 people in there at a time because that may be fine for one business, but not for another. Great. Well, again, oh, Renell, go ahead. I, I was going to add upon that. That's kind of part of what we, we help navigate and follow through too. If we can relook at the, at the space and what way you can create flow um, so that people aren't cross, you know, crossing back over each other. And, um, and also thinking of your employees and their traffic um, that they have too. So they can be a little bit more strategic. Maybe they use the a stock room and maybe they keep supplies up at the, at the front of the business, you know, behind a, in drawers or something so that they don't have to cross over somewhere where clients are going to be, you know, they're constantly creating that, um, you know, less than six foot um, distancing. It's, it's just, it, it is a lot of creation. And, and, you know, I know on my, my behalf, each business, it's, it's been very creative in nature for myself and my clinicians. That's awesome. Well, thank you all uh, for doing this. We're at our time here. Um, I do want to thank the county and the superstar team we had, Lori Sallow, Liz Pazawan, Dr. Rick Rosen, Anita Konopa, um, for being out here, and Carolyn Berg especially, who is an all-star. She's helped us with all of these, and we're super thankful. All of you, thank you so much for helping our members and our folks joining us today to understand all these pieces. Additionally, thank you so much, Renell Baldwin, founder of Dignified Hope Care, for joining us. Um, obviously, if folks need to get in touch with the county, there's a big website with the county. <laughs> you can connect public health and uh, environmental health. Renell, how do folks, folks find you? Um, I have a website, www.dignifiedhopecare.com, um, or you can even reach me personally at Renell at dignifiedhopecare.com, and I will do my best to answer or navigate or direct you to, to all the resources that I'm getting um, along this way. Well, thank you so much. And I, what I'll say is, we, again, for uh, everyone, um, w this video will be available on our Facebook uh, shortly after. We will also pull all of these questions together and get them all and make sure all the answers are in there and send those back out in an email tomorrow. Uh, next week, normally this is from Thursday to two to three, we are here. Um, doing these free webinars. Next week will be different. We have an event planned um, to talk with two employment law attorneys about some of the things you need to consider as a business owner and as uh, to what I was talking and Renell was talking about earlier, uh, the liability issues that you need to consider. So watch for that email uh, to sign up for uh, our event uh, next Thursday at 2 p.m. And uh, we hope you'll get a chance to join us over on Working Lunch on Fridays at noon over on our Facebook page. We'll be talking with Brent Burchett from the Slow Farm Bureau. 
and we hope you have a great rest of the day. Thanks for joining us. Stay safe and healthy.